Many of the things that were just brought up in that movie, combined sewer overflows, uh, the issue of uh, water prices not matching water costs, aging infrastructure, leaks, all that stuff uh, is uh, much of what I'm going to talk about uh, for the next hour or so. Um, just as a couple of couple of things, they were showing the, the pipes that hadn't been replaced for 100 years since they were put in. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a big main break up on Montrose. And one at least one of the pipes that they pulled out uh, was a hollowed out tree that was that had been installed at some point in the past because they didn't have a pipe uh, and so they used this hollowed out tree as part of the system go figure uh, eventually it eroded and burst the same happens though with uh, uh, pipes that are made of brick and mortar same happens with metal pipes the same happens with a bunch of uh, cheap composite pipes that were installed in the 60s and 70s. So it's not even just age that's the issue, it's the materials themselves. So, uh, okay, so what we're gonna do right now, uh, there's a lot that we could talk about. I'm gonna give an overview of the region's different water supplies, uh, Lake Michigan, shallow aquifers, deep aquifers, and the Fox and Kankakee rivers. Uh, talk about some of the challenges to managing those resources. Um, talk a little bit about some discussions that are going on with the Chicago River right now um, and then talk a little bit about some ideas on what to do at a local level uh, or in schools, uh, etc. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot that I could talk about that didn't make it into the presentation. All right. Uh, the Metropolitan Planning Council, we've been around uh, now for 75 years. I have not been there the entire time. Um, but we work on a variety of different things. We work on transportation solutions, so we're advocates uh, for the CTA, considering things uh, like bike sharing programs or expanding the red line uh, or creating bus rapid transit, things like that. I work a lot on uh, water supply issues, some on wastewater and stormwater, but primarily on water supply uh, and a whole host of other things. We're a nonprofit, non-government organization, and again, we've been around for 75 years. Uh, I'll skip this. We've put out a lot of reports, good solid reports that have led to policy change uh, here in the state. We work with Open Lands, which is another nonprofit. They're an open space protection organization. Uh, okay. Water supplies in northeastern Illinois. Actually, I'm going to hide that for a second. Okay. Just uh, raise your hands if you live and or work in the city of Chicago. Okay. Put your hands down. All right. Anybody live and or work in Lake County? Uh, Will County, one in the back, two, wow, Will County, all right, uh, DuPage, okay, a few from DuPage, Kane, one from Kane, McHenry, hey, uh, DeKalb, Boone, anywhere else, Wisconsin, all right, how about Indiana, what's that, Cook, well, oh, greater Cook County outside of Chicago, yes, okay, all right. Um, all right, probably if you live in Chicago or work in Chicago, you know that your water comes from where? Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan. All right. Now, outside of Chicago, it gets a little more hazy, okay? Uh, particularly if you're in one of the outlying counties like Will or Kendall or, or DuPage, um, McHenry, uh, it, there's a very good chance that you yourselves, who are all very nice people, uh, do not know where your water comes from, uh, and there's an even likelier chance that your students and their parents uh, do not know where their waters come from. There's actually a fairly high chance that your mayor doesn't know where the water comes from, uh, which is uh, a problem. Uh, okay, so where does water come from? All right, in the region, uh, the light blue communities here, so you see uh, the majority of Cook County, although not all of it, uh, parts, uh, the m most of DuPage, parts of Lake, uh, and then sections of Will County, uh, get Lake Michigan water, okay? Uh, and that water gets to them. The majority of it is pumped by the City of Chicago Department of Water Management, okay? So this is a City of Chicago enterprise, and they sell water to uh, the direct suburbs like Oak Park or Blue Island or Evanston who directly border the city. Those cities then uh, jack up the price and sell it to the next community to the north or west or south. Those communities then sell, and it keeps going. And I think the, I think the, the longest connection is, is four communities. 
Um, the blue here, and there's a slide and a couple slides to show the difference between deep aquifers and shallow aquifers. But the blue here is groundwater uh, of one of two, two types. Uh, and then the green, there's only a handful um, that use either the Fox or Kankakee rivers. It's about 4% of uh, the region's water is supplied by those surface rivers, okay? The difference between aquifers is uh, very significant, okay? Uh, deep aquifers, uh, which are more than 400 or 500 feet below the surface of the ground, uh, are capped by solid bedrock. Uh, and if you've ever tried to pour water through a rock, it takes a long time. Um, th these deep aquifers, when you pump water out, uh, it's more or less like uh, mining gold or coal or something out of a mountain, okay? Uh, that is not... You know, we say water is a renewable resource. Deep aquifer water is not a renewable resource, okay? Not in any sort of human time scale, right? There are places where you can infiltrate water back into the aquifer, uh, but it doesn't happen too, too often, okay? Shallow aquifers, which are, so like 400 feet to the surface of the ground, uh, these are more renewable. Uh, when it rains, they can recharge, assuming that you're not consuming more water than is going back in. Uh, one of the challenges with shallow aquifers is that they are, through sort of these subterranean connections, uh, tied to wetlands and rivers and everything. So as you take water out of a shallow aquifer, uh, you're going to draw down levels in a wetland or a river in the nearby area. Okay? <clears throat> All right. We talked, and I know you've talked in the past couple of days, and I even mentioned it yesterday, about this idea of political boundaries versus hydrological boundaries, okay? And here's a couple shots in the, in the Middle East again, um, not of political units that exist today, but of the Babylonian Empire uh, on the left and the Egyptian Empire on the right. And what you notice is that the political unit is approximately the same geography as the watershed for that, that water source. This is great. It makes centralized management of the water source relatively straightforward. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it's not what we have today, even in these places where now you have nation states competing for water. It's also not the same as what we have here in the United States, where typically rivers, uh, in particular, form boundaries between places. So this is the Ohio River. You can see there's a half dozen states just on this portion of it, and I don't know, hundreds of counties. And then within those counties, probably thousands, if not tens of thousands, of municipalities uh, that are adjacent to this river. And so management of the water supply is incredibly complex because of these uh, different political boundaries. Okay? The same is true for groundwater, uh, and the same is even true for uh, the Great Lakes, which of course have two countries, uh, eight states, two provinces, and thousands and thousands of municipalities interacting with those lakes. Don't worry about this map. It's incredibly hard to understand, um, especially from the distance that you're sitting, but that's sort of the point, okay? These are the water supplies in northeastern Illinois. The red border is the uh, jurisdiction of the, of the northeastern Illinois Regional Water Supply Planning Group, who just put out the regional plan, and this is the snapshot of, of that plan. So it, inc it includes Cook County, uh, the immediate satellite counties, and all the way out to Boone, DeKalb, Grundy and Kankakee. Uh, you see Lake Michigan underlying this whole thing. What, what, what you think is the white background on the map is actually the deep aquifer that is underneath the entire region. And then you have different depths of shallow aquifers overlying that, as well as rivers. It's very confusing. There's 11 counties. There's 400 something municipalities just in our little corner of the world uh, trying to manage these water resources. Okay. So knowing that regional coordination, like they mentioned in there for, for Pittsburgh, regional coordination, not necessarily regional management, but regional coordination was going to be a big issue. Uh, we, along with the uh, former governor, who shall not be named, uh, issued an executive order um, creating two regional water supply planning groups here in the state. The idea is that eventually the entire state will be covered by these regional water supply planning groups. So we have one here, it's those 11 counties right there, uh, and it's managed by this group called the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Um, and they spent the last three years doing a regional water supply plan, okay? 
they are not a water management authority. They don't control any decision making, but they sat down with stakeholders from the municipalities, the counties, business groups, agricultural groups, uh, power generators, uh, and, and came up with this regional plan, hopefully to uh, drive decision making going forward. And they ran a couple of demand scenarios. Uh, the current trend scenario that you see here uh, assumes a certain level of population growth, 32% uh, population growth between 2005 and, and 2050. Um, it assumes that people will kind of conserve more water as we're sort of seeing right now in society, but it's more or less the status quo, what we have right now, uh, and suggests that by 2050 our, water, our demand for water uh, is going to grow about 36 percent. Of course, our water supplies are not going to grow at all. So uh, we'll have a 36 percent increase in demand for water. Uh, the less resource intensive, if we all start using rain barrels and shower heads and we increase our water prices and uh, we focus population growth in Cook County and DuPage County where there's existing infrastructure, then we can reduce it to a 7 percent growth rate. Uh, and if we go hog wild, uh, which is actually much more likely than the less resource of intensive uh, scenario, we could actually be looking at 65% increase in water consumption. So demand in the region is going up, water supplies uh, are not going up, if anything they're going the other direction. The biggest driver of this is population pressures, okay? Uh, the chart on the left shows population growth out to 2050. The brown area at the top is uh, Cook County alone. Uh, the blue area is the surrounding collar counties. The orange area is the really far out ones of Boone and DeKalb uh, and Grundy, which just have very low population. What you see is that by 2050, not only is the entire region's population much, much higher, but the collar counties around Cook County, which primarily do not use Lake Michigan water, uh, are almost half of the region's population. So the growth is largely occurring where the water supplies are most stressed and challenged. And this is uh, a problem. The Lake Michigan diversion, okay, I'm going to go through each of the different water sources that we have and talk about some of the, some of the issues with them. But the Lake Michigan diversion, as you all know, uh, you've talked about it a couple times now, I think. Uh, in about 1900, we reversed the Chicago River and we built a canal system that connects Lake Michigan ultimately to the Mississippi River, okay. Um, we did that to improve the quality of the region's water. We were putting our wastewater directly into the lake uh, and we were having cholera and typhoid problems here in the city because we were drinking contaminated water. Lake Michigan then, as it is now, is the major water supply for the region. Uh, so they built this canal and they reversed the river. Okay? For a long time and to this day, most of the other states on the Great Lakes really don't like us because we take all of this water out of the lakes and we don't put it back in. Okay? Other big cities, Toronto, Cleveland, Milwaukee, everybody else on the Great Lakes takes water out of the lakes, they use it, they flush it down the toilet, they clean it up, and they put it back in the lakes. We don't, we're the only place that doesn't. So we are this drain on lake levels, okay? With that in mind, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1967 capped the amount of water that we are allowed to take every year, okay? And it's 3,200 cubic feet per second, which comes out to about 2 billion gallons a day, all right? In, 19, uh, sorry, in 2005, uh, which was a drought year, we used about 85% of what we're allowed to take from Lake Michigan. Okay? So right now we have some leeway, we have some additional capacity to take water out of the lake, which is good because our population is growing. Uh, however, our population is growing quite quickly and there are communities like Western Lake County and Aurora, some of these places that are on groundwater, that are looking at Lake Michigan as their future water supply. So not tomorrow and not next year, but probably within the next 20 years, we will be at our cap for how much water we can take out of Lake Michigan, and, and that's it, right? Um, places like Milwaukee and Cleveland and Toronto do not have that same uh, cap. They, for all intents and purposes, have an infinite water supply because they're constantly recycling uh, the same stuff. We're going to come back to this gray footprint here in a, in a minute. More about the diversion. Um, again, from 2005, you can see that of the water we used, about 60% was for actual use. Um, discretionary, that 9.2, uh, that's to flush the river clean 
uh, when it gets too dirty. Um, and hopefully when the deep tunnel project or, or tarp is finished, we won't need that 9.2 anymore because the river, in theory, won't have any sewage in it, which we'll come back to in a second. Uh, there's some for navigation. There's some that's just leakage. And then there's this other big chunk, the 27.7%, which is stormwater. All right? And you saw some shots in there of stormwater. Stormwater is, is rain that hits roofs, hits parking lots. Uh, and instead of infiltrating into the ground, uh, it runs off into a sewer system. Chicago, like some of the cities there, uh, has a combined sewer system. Uh, and we have lots of stormwater issues here. So going back to this map, uh, when we reverse the river, we fundamentally change the hydrology of the region. This gray area on the map, before the reversal of the river, all of the rain falling in that area would have flown to one of the rivers and then to the lake. Okay? Now, because of the reversal of the river, all of the rain that hits the roofs and hits the parking lots in that gray area runs into the sewers and the U.S. Supreme Court considers that water that we took out of Lake Michigan, okay? Uh, so that roughly 28% of our diversion uh, is water that we never used for anything, uh, but fell on the parking lots, clogged up our sewers, then we clean it up, and then we get rid of it, okay? And it, and it reduces the, so this is this weird paradox inside this gray area. The more it rains, the less water we can pump from Lake Michigan. Okay? This is part of our water supply, and we are literally flushing it down the toilet. Figuratively flushing it down the toilet. Uh, all right. So again, this is more on that stormwater issue. Okay? So there are two things that we could do with that stormwater thing. If we could capture the water and use it for something, like these rain barrels here, uh, that would reduce that amount. Or if we could actually put some water some of that rainwater, that stormwater, back into the lake, it would also reduce the stormwater part of the diversion. Um, it's a m an immense amount of water. It's, it's uh, on, on average, it's any given year, here it says 588, but in any given year, depending on whether it's a rainy year or a drought year, it's about 500 million gallons of water a day. 500 million gallons of water a day is how much all of suburban Chicago takes out of groundwater sources in a day. So. Yes, parts of the region are facing water scarcity and water stresses, but the region as a whole has water. Uh, we're, we're sending it to St. Louis and to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, so we're not using our water as efficiently as we could. That uh, is the roof of McCormick Place. It's one of the few places in, the, in Chicago, it's actually one of two places in Chicago, that catches rainwater, never puts it into the sewer system, instead filters it and then runs it directly back into Lake Michigan. Okay, the other part is right out here. Uh, it's South Lakeshore Drive. Uh, when it was re-engineered several years ago, uh, they, they built it in such a way that after the first inch of rain, which is where you get oils and road salts and everything in the water, after the first inch of rain, all that water goes back into Lake Michigan. The first inch goes into the sewer system. Allocation is different from diversion. Okay? Uh, diversion is how much water Illinois can take Allocation is how IDNR, the Department of Natural Resources, uh, determines which communities get how much water. Okay? This is a map showing the spread of the Lake Michigan infrastructure system. So the lightest blue communities uh, were receiving Lake Michigan water uh, before 1960. And as it gets darker blue, it's showing new communities that are receiving Lake Michigan water. You can see that with Plainfield on the border of Will and Kendall County, Lake Michigan water actually gets pumped as far as Kendall County. Um, in the allocation system, there are some problems. Uh, he mentioned, uh, the guy from Las Vegas mentioned unaccounted for flows. This is water that sort of just disappears out of the system. The utility pumps it out, but it never arrives at anybody's house. Uh, IDNR requests that you keep your unaccounted for flow at 8% or less, but they have no ability to actually confirm whether or not you are doing that. Um, there's also some other problems. The older your pipes, the more you're allowed to leak. So if your pipes were installed in 1960 or before, you're allowed to leak 3,000 gallons per mile per day. If your pipes are from 1960 to 1970, it's 2,500 gallons per mile per day, and as they get newer, the numbers go less. So there's very little incentive built into the system to rehabilitate or reinvest in your pipes. 
Loss and leakage are, are a big issue. This last point here, Chicago, which for municipalities is one of the, the sort of greener and more sustainably minded uh, communities out there. Uh, it's also the biggest, however. Uh, and every day as we speak, uh, Chicago is losing millions and millions and millions of gallons just lost in the system. Either it leaks from a known leak like a water main break or it just kind of disappears. People are using it and it's not metered or it's leaking in unknown leaks. Sometimes people steal it uh, at construction sites or something. Um, all told, between the known leaks and the unaccounted for flow, we're talking 55 million gallons a day, that's as much as Kane County as a whole uses in a day. So again, loss and leakage. And we pay for all of that. We don't pay for it on the water bills because it never arrives at our house. Instead, we make it up with property tax or sales tax revenue. Uh, we have to pay for the Department of Water Management to pump it out. Uh, it just never arrived, so it's not on our bills. But we do pay for it. Again, 10% leakage is considered good. All right. Um, there is a major difference uh, in pricing, even within the Lake Michigan area, of public water utilities versus private water utilities. One of the things they're pointing out uh, in the movie is that the, the price we pay for water often does not match the cost of providing that water. Okay? Cost and price are two different things. Okay? In the case of like a bottle of Coca-Cola, it probably costs about 45 cents to make the bottle of Coca-Cola and we pay a buck 50 at the store. Okay? And that's where their profit margin is. Right? In, the, in the case of water, it's the exact opposite. Uh, we pay a price that is lower than the cost of providing it. Okay? Um, this is in Illinois true for public water utilities where the decisions about how, to, how much to charge for water are politically charged. No mayor or councilman or whatever wants to be on watch when the water rates get raised. Okay? Uh, in communities that have a private water utility, those utilities are required by law, uh, by Illinois state law, to charge for the full cost of providing water service. That's why when you go to Bolingbrook and pay $7 for 1,000 gallons of water versus Chicago where it's $2 for 1,000 gallons of water, that's where the difference is. The, the private water utility has to charge what it actually costs to provide the water. In a public situation, it's, it's there, you're subsidizing the rates through sales taxes or property taxes, uh, or in many cases, public water utilities are not collecting money to save and invest in the future. They're paying for basic operations today without putting away money for capital investments later on. So there is this big difference between public water utilities and private water utilities in how they charge. Of course, a major problem with private water utilities is that the profit motive of the private utility is included as a cost of providing water, which many people think uh, is inappropriate or unfair. Okay. Uh, there's also, with all of this leakage and loss and then our general water consumption, there are great connections between energy consumption and water consumption, okay? About 4% of the entire nation's energy consumption is for pumping, treating, and then pumping again drinking water, and then collecting, treating, and getting rid of wastewater. Uh, at a municipal level, so for, for uh, a, a particular suburb just to the west of Chicago, whose name I'm not allowed to say, but which has a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright houses, um, the, the, the budget that for the water utility, the public water utility, about 80% of that budget is dedicated to electricity, energy, okay? Uh, it takes as much energy to run your hot water faucet for five minutes as it does to run a light bulb for 14, okay? Uh, we use a lot of energy to move water, and if that water is never arriving at your house because it leaked out of the system, that's wasted energy and wasted money, wasted carbon emissions, it's wasted everything, okay? So it's more than just water that's at stake here. All right, groundwater. Uh, shallow aquifers, uh, the communities in light blue on this map uh, get their water from shallow aquifers. Uh, so you can see lots of western Lake County uh, and McHenry County and then some places in Will. The, the communities that are in sort of Superman blue are, are a mix of shallow and deep. And then the communities, the one, the couple in Kankakee that are that, that bright green are a mix of river and shallow aquifer. Um, 
you don't need a permit to drop a well in Illinois. Uh, if you want to drop a well, just go do it. Um, and as a result, the state does not have a whole lot of data or information on shallow aquifer trends uh, here in Illinois. So there's not a whole lot to talk about. Um, they do recharge faster, but they are connected to wetlands uh, and surface water. So when you take water out of one, you take water out of the other. <coughs> uh, deep aquifers are the major water concern for our region. And this is a map. Uh, the, 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 the image on the left matches the image on the right. Chicago is to the right. And then you can see it go through Riverside, Lombard, all the way out to DeKalb. And this is showing a uh, drop down from the surface. Uh, the, the yellow and the red there are shallow aquifers. The uh, light blue layers that are kind of washed out here are the deep aquifers. And there's layers of bedrock uh, that, that are in between. So we have these two deep aquifers, the Ansel and the Ironton Galesville. Uh, and those are, uh, again, 400 feet or deeper. Then there's this huge aquifer uh, below at the Elmhurst, uh, but unfortunately it's salt water, so we're not going to be tapping into that anytime soon. Again, when you take water out of these deep aquifers, it doesn't go back in. So this is a map uh, showing 2025 of the, the Ansel, one of those two aquifers, and you can see where in 2025 the expected drawdowns are. Uh, there is some expected drawdown in, in Cook County, sorry, the yellow the closer to red, the bigger the problem. Uh, Northern Cook County b before 1960 was using aquifer water. Now it's using Lake Michigan water. But then they have these two pockets, which are Joliet and Aurora, which are two of the fastest growing suburban areas in the region. So this is 2025. There's 2050. You see these more pronounced drawdowns, again, under Joliet and Aurora. That's the Ansel. Uh, this is the Ironton Galesville, which is even deeper. And again, you see this hole right under Joliet extending up to Aurora. Uh, and then if we go to 2050, uh, it's similar and it expands up into other parts of Kane and DuPage County. The Illinois State Water Survey has said pretty conclusively that they don't expect the deep aquifers in the region to be sustainable past 2030 or 2040 or so. Surface water, hey, some good news. Uh, the Fox River, there's been more study done on the Fox than the Kankakee. The Fox River can probably support a little more use than it currently does. Um, but again, you take water out of the Fox and it's going to drain water out of the, the adjacent wetlands and, and uh, rivers, shallow aquifers, I should say. So sort of the picture for the region. The last time I gave this presentation was on April 14th, 2010. Sorry, I didn't update the date. It's true today as well. Uh, northeastern Illinois as a whole, as a one unit, does not face water scarcity, but pockets of the region do. Okay? There are places where the aquifers, the deep aquifers for the long term are drying up, uh, and then during drought conditions, those places with the shallow aquifers face water scarcity issues as well. Okay? We do, as a region, face immense inefficiency and waste issues. Okay? Uh, just as a quick question, how many miles of pipe does the city of Chicago have just in Chicago for moving only drinking water? So this isn't the region, and this doesn't include wastewater. Any guesses? How many miles of pipe in the city of Chicago for moving drinking water? A thousand. Anybody else? What's that? Five thousand. It's four thousand two hundred. Okay, 4,200 miles of pipe for moving drinking water, and that's just in the city of Chicago. Now, think about all the other communities that get Lake Michigan water, so you're probably talking three times as much, and then double it to move the wastewater. Okay? We have tens of thousands of miles of pipe underneath the ground uh, under us as we speak. Uh, every year, the city of Chicago fixes 70 miles of pipe. That's what the budget currently allows for. So they fixed 70 miles of pipe, 70, out of 4,200. Okay? Um, and 70 is up from the last 20 or 30 years when they were doing 30 to 40 miles of pipe. Okay? There simply isn't enough money out there to replace and fix all of these pipes. Uh, another big issue in the city of Chicago specifically, um, all right, who in here 
lives in a, either a single family home or a two flat home in the city of Chicago. Okay, of you people, how many of you have a water meter? One, two, okay, so not quite half. Are you sure you have a water meter? Positive, you know where, where is it? All right, where's yours? All right, in the city of Chicago, you guys are in the vast minority, all right? There are 350,000 homes, not people, 350,000 homes, single family or two flat homes in the city of Chicago that do not have a water meter. Okay? So people in those homes do not know how much water they use. The city of Chicago doesn't know how much water those people use. Their, their bill is not determined by the amount of water that they use. It's based on a property assessment of the size, age, and expected number of fixtures in your house. Okay? So, if, so if you didn't have a water meter, for those people that don't, you could, if you wanted to, run an illegal water bottling company out of your house. Right? You could, you could bottle water and you could sell it uh, and you would never pay for the extra water. I live in a multifamily building here in, uh, in Hyde Park. Uh, there are 100 units in my building. My personal water consumption has almost no effect on the amount of water, on the amount that I pay into my monthly bill. Okay? I could run an illegal water bottling company out of my apartment. Um, and that cost would be distributed throughout everybody in my building. Okay, so it's not going to come back to me. I don't, I don't do that, and I don't recommend that you do. Um, but this is this is a huge problem. If people don't know how much water they're using, they use more than they should. Okay, as soon as you get a water meter, uh, numbers show that you start consuming 20 to 30 percent less water. Okay. Uh, so the city has these plans to fix water mains and to put in water meters, and they think that once they do both of those, uh, they'll, they'll uh, be able to ha serve another 700,000 people with, with water. Again, 350,000 homes in the city of Chicago, they're trying to put in 7,000 meters a year, and they're already having trouble doing it. You do the math. It's going to take them a while. Okay? All right. So, some things that were talked about, these rain barrels, okay, there, there are things we can do, right? Um, and there are challenges to doing them, right? We, we could, in theory, use rain, in particular, for non-potable uses. We could, we could capture rain and put it in the toilet. Right now, 30% of your household use is flushing the toilets, and all that water is, is potable drinking water. Don't drink out of your toilet, but you could if you wanted to, okay? Um, there are technologies in dry states like Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and wet states like Washington and Oregon to run water off of your roof into a cistern that's usually underground, and then that runs into your toilets, or it can be used outside to wash your car or for additional irrigation or something like that. Those are called rainwater harvesting systems. What was mentioned earlier before was, were gray water systems, which is different. That's capturing water that's gone through your washing machine, dishwasher, shower, sink, capturing that water, and then either using that in your toilets or for some outdoor uses, okay? Right now, neither rainwater reuse or gray water reuse is permissible in the state of Illinois, okay? This is not a city issue. This is an Illinois Department of Public Health issue, okay? It's, it's not illegal. It's illegal. It, it's just not in the plumbing code. So plumbers can't install the systems. If we revised the plumbing code and gave plumbers and, and pipe fitters some safety standards to work with, we could start putting these systems in. Okay? And we at MPC are working on legislation to, uh, to force a, a revision of the plumbing code. Okay? Um, there are a couple places that you can go and take your students, if you wanted to, to see some of these systems at work. Uh, Lake County's Forest Preserves, their Ryerson Woods uh, Visitor Center, captures rain, uses it to flush the toilets. HSBC, which is a financial firm, they have a campus up in Metawa, they do the same thing. There are a couple places in the city of Chicago that recycle gray water. Uh, there's a, um, an affordable housing complex at Clybourne and Division. Maybe. Uh, I forget the exact address. Uh, and they recycle gray water and use it in the toilets. Okay? 
Uh, the Shedd Aquarium, Sarah had to leave, but the Shedd Aquarium has a large system built to actually recycle rainwater in some of the tanks in the aquarium. Uh, they can't get a permit from the Department of Public Health, so they can't turn it on. So they put in the system, and now they can't use it. And green infrastructure solutions. Um, this, is a, this is a driveway, and you can see that there's vegetation there. And so when rain falls, it infiltrates into the driveway instead of running off into the sewer. That's basically what green infrastructure is. It's a decentralized system for using natural processes to capture stormwater, rain in particular, and keep it out of the sewer system. And there are things that you can do from a rain barrel to a rain garden uh, on your property or at your school, and we could talk more about those in a bit. However, all right, in Chicago, because of this big gray area, in theory, you could do two things. You could both keep water out of the sewer system with this green infrastructure stuff, and if the rivers went back into the lake, then just by force of gravity, the water infiltrating into the ground would eventually percolate back to the river, which would then go back to the lake. Right now, uh, we only get one half of the possible benefits from green infrastructure here in this gray area because the river goes the opposite direction. Okay? Uh, so it's great for keeping water out of the sewer system, but it doesn't help recharge Lake Michigan. It doesn't help recharge our water supply. It could if the river went the other way. Five minutes. All right. Now I'm going to have to go fast. Okay, so we get to the Chicago River, all right? There are, for the first time in a long time, serious people, Illinois Department of Natural Resources, the governor's office, mm, me, I'm relatively serious. There are serious people talking seriously about the costs and benefits of re-reversing the Chicago River, of separating the Great Lakes from the Mississippi River Basin. And I'm very quickly, it's going to be longer than five minutes, but bear with me, I'm very quickly going to go through the multiple reasons why that kind of planning should be considered. I'm not saying it's the right choice. I'm saying it's not a crazy idea. Uh, and we need to look at the costs and benefits over the next 100 years to determine if that's the way we should be going. Okay? Again, 1900, we had these one primary goal of providing clean water. As you saw on the chart from the speaker right before me, filtration, chlorination, which we still don't do, uh, weren't it, it created until 1906 and then, and then the teens. So we did not have the wastewater treatment technologies in 1900 to clean the water uh, to the standards that we do today. It also enabled freight movement through the system. Okay? We've talked a lot about the water issues. Okay? Because we don't put water back into the lake, we have a finite water source. Everybody else on the Great Lakes has, for all intents and purposes, an infinite water source. They're recycling the same water over and over and over again. Okay? Again, not today, but 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, there will be businesses looking to relocate out of Phoenix, out of Atlanta, out of arid places in this country and others, and they're going to want to come to the Great Lakes, and Chicago is going to be disadvantaged in attracting those businesses because we will have a finite water supply, whereas everybody else will have an infinite water supply for all intents and purposes. And we lose all of this water. If the river went back into the lake, then we could start to put rainwater back into the lake, which would be a good thing. Okay? What is that water in the river that we're talking about? It's treated wastewater. Okay? The water in the river when you cross over Michigan Avenue did not come directly from Lake Michigan. It came from the, one of the seven wastewater treatment plants in the region. It is treated effluent. Okay? It is not, it's lake water a couple times removed. All right? We drank it, we flushed it down the toilet, we cleaned it, and we put it in the river. Okay? Uh, that water comes out of the wastewater treatment plants, if there were some sort of physical barrier somewhere in the river at the right point, then all the water to the east could flow back into the lake and water to the west would flow back, uh, would keep going to the river. But there would be a physical separation. Okay? This, is, this is an issue already today. All right? uh, the wastewater that we put into the river is not treated for certain things. We, we contribute about 5% of the pollutant load in the Gulf of Mexico dead zone uh, with phosphates and ammonias and nitrates and things that are not removed in our wastewater treatment process. Okay? We don't have to because it's not in the law. All right? uh, and so we are contributing already to pollution issues somewhere else. And this disinfection debate that you can perhaps have read about in the papers uh, is, a, is a debate between the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District who cleans our water and pretty much everybody else in the world about whether or not to add an additional treatment process 
that would, like we were talking about before, either use UV rays or chlorine to kill bacteria that are in the water that we're not taking out. Uh, we talked about the water supply issues. Freight is another big issue. Uh, we do move a lot of freight on the waterway system. It's big piles of stuff, salt, coal, uh, scrap metal. It's not containers like you see on a truck or a, uh, or a train, okay? Well, more and more goods are being moved in those containers. Right now, there are very few places on the waterway system where you could efficiently move those big truck containers to a train and then to an airport, or, you know, whatever. We don't have those kind of intermodal facilities on the waterway system. We have places where you pull up with a big barge with a big pile of road salt on it, you use a big shovel, you put it on the ground, you wait for trucks to come and get it. It's not a super efficient system. So if we're smart, perhaps there's a way to put a, to put a barrier for water purposes and on top of that, build some sort of onloading, offloading facility to actually make freight movement more efficient and hopefully increase the amount of freight on the waterway systems. Unfortunately, right now, so much of this issue has been about closing locks as an emergency response to uh, an invasive species, and folks who move freight are not part of these longer-term discussions on, on how to improve freight movement. Uh, and then we come to the invasive species issue, which I know Ruben talked about before. Um, the Asian carp, this is not a map of Asian carp, this is a map of zebra mussel sightings or, or reports uh, throughout the two basins. Uh, Asian carp is, is just the most recent and the biggest and the funniest of uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of, of invasive species that have moved throughout the system. So as we think about the future of the waterway system, we have to remember that things have changed since 1900 except for the basic operation of the waterway system, right? Um, we, we now know that uh, CSOs, uh, combined sewer overflows, uh, are a problem. We know that we're uh, facing these water shortage issues. We know that we don't like invasive species. We know that we want to move more freight by barges, okay? Uh, and so we need to change our goals. And this is the conversation that people are starting to have about what do we want the waterway system to do for the next 100 years, uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that that discussion either at the Army Corps of Engineers or uh, through Illinois Department of Natural Resources, I'm hoping that will become a much more uh, inclusive debate uh, and discussion with all of the interested parties. Uh, I, personal opinion of Josh Ellis, I think in the next 20 to 30 years we're going to separate the systems and, and reverse at least portions of the Chicago River uh, to put water back into the lake. Uh, I think. I, the, the argument for it is substantial. The argument against it is substantial as well. What we don't have is a comprehensive cost-benefit analysis uh, to make that decision with. People are working on the analysis now. So I'll stop there. There's a lot to talk about. We can talk about it. So. Oh. We can come back to this, but I have a whole bunch of resources that we talked about yesterday. Um, and I'm sure Jamie will, will, will share the share the uh, the PowerPoint. I promised yesterday um, locations on on the on the internet of different GIS databases for you know taking files of rivers and wetlands and stuff and overlaying them on Google Earth. That's what uh, th this one from uh, the Illinois Natural Resources Geospatial Data Clearinghouse rolls off the tongue. They have lots of uh, aerial footage, uh, aerial photography from different periods. Um, the GreenMapping.org is all of this, all of the, you know, the rivers, park systems, everything that you can overlay. Um, and yeah, there's a whole lot of information here. And if you're curious about rain barrels and coming up with a plan for your, for your school, go and talk to the people at, at the Center for Green Technology, which is an offshoot of the City Department of Environment. And they can tell you all about how to do it and what works best for your home, your school, your factory, your airport, whatever. Okay, now I'm done. Great, we'll be able to do questions for about 10 minutes or so. And actually, um, I want to start us off with one, which is um, this, this phrase that we've been using throughout the, throughout the institute um, that I believe you coined for us, that every problem starts as a solution. Okay. So what are some of the potential problems that you see with the solution of the re-reversal of the Chicago River? Some of the potential problems. Most of the sewer pipes in the region are built to uh, take water away from the lake towards some of the sewer plants, and they're based on, a, on gravity, more or less. Uh, they go the other direction. Um, and so trying to 
move treated effluent um, even if you improve the treatment process so that you can put it back into the lake moving it back that direction will be a, a big hurdle um, and then if you're not careful if you uh, cause disruptions in freight movement that cannot be overcome uh, you have the potential to lose jobs there but I think I'm really confident that that can be worked out so the Other biggest questions? issue is getting water back in an efficient manner other questions and the first step the first step which we should be doing anyway the first step to ever putting water back in the lake was going to be improving our treatment processes to, to a point where the water can safely be put back into the lake but we should do that regardless of what direction the river goes so um, I just had a question about um, Chicago was known for marshes and swamps and mm -hmm. everything has is there any talk about reestablishing some of that type of environment yes, uh, yes there is so uh, sort of um, it, it, it's interesting okay hmm. the marshes and the swamps and everything that we do have in Chicago like uh, at Jackson Park the lagoon over here or Washington Park um, when it's dry for a couple weeks and we don't get any rain they turn on the tap and fill it up with drinking water just so that it's aesthetically uh, pleasing right um, so that's a problem um, if we could build sort of urban watersheds uh, that collected stormwater and ran them into the parks uh, so that those water levels would be maintained by stormwater that would be a lot more natural and we keep stormwater out of the sewer system there is there is talk but no plan of trying to use vacant lots in places strategically located vacant lots to convert those back into something like wetlands to capture stormwater runoff in in localized areas so there's there's talk there isn't a, a plan I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be a plan uh, in the relatively near future we have a lot of vacant lots that could be doing more to help with stormwater issues so I had a question about uh, aquifers and tiled farmlands so out in Kane and McHenry mm -hmm. and um, when a farmer tiles and hopefully they're not doing as much anymore because they're right. getting paid to keep wetlands where does that water go does it does it recharge the ground water some surely goes through and leaks through but often it runs off into a surface river and runs off somewhere else capturing agricultural pollutants and fertilizers and, and running off into a river so yes uh, that used to happen a lot um, and now happens less putting putting tiles under the fields yes um, I have a question about the water meters sure and um, we had a speaker a parent speaker come at the end of the year to talk to our sixth graders about his work with some aspect of the city and mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. And it, from the way he described the water meter situation, it, I, because I asked him specifically about the 26 uh, unit condo that I live in and how could we, it, and putting in individual water meters and how our condo board talked about it and that sort of thing, because they thought people would use less water in the long run. And he made it sound like we would have to pay for it ourselves. Uh, you probably would okay because it's not done as a matter of course so it, I know I know one place in the United States that actually does sub metering in apartment buildings and not too surprisingly it's Portland Oregon um, right which is the you know the progressive right. bastion of whatever um, yeah they do sub metering in in multi-unit buildings but it doesn't happen elsewhere so, so the 7,000 meters you're talking about that a year yeah uh, a year that's the city doesn't pay for that or the city does at, oh. at those single family homes it's only yeah. single family okay yeah right single family or two flat homes now new construction in the city of Chicago you have to put a meter in and when you do a rehab of some scale or dollar amount you have to put one in um, and something something about transactions so there are there are sort of backdoor ways to get them installed but if you're not selling your home if you're not rehabbing your home if you're dying and handing it over to your children and the home stays in the family you're not going to get a meter in um, now right now the city's pro uh, program is voluntary they're looking for the first 7,000 people they're trying to take those 7,000 people and make them into sort of water metering disciples who will then tell their neighbors no the government didn't take over my <laughs> my house no 
I, I'm not paying more for water. No, they didn't ruin my life, right? In fact, I'm using less water. Uh, I'm paying for the water that I use. I'm more conscious of leaks. They want, they want those, those 7,000 first wave of people, this, this sort of uh, innovation adoption curve that was up here before. They want them to be the, uh, the missionaries to convince their neighbors, which is a good idea. Yeah, sure. Um, just to continue, it's interesting, the, the idea to divert the water, re-divert the water back to Lake Michigan. I, so I prefer the term forwarding the Chicago River. Forwarding. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful, progressive. Um, if you're saying that the, the plumbing of the, of the sewage wastewater is, you know, going down to the river, I mean, is, would, there, would there be the idea then that the divider would be later, uh, farther down? Yeah, I mean, there's seven wastewater treatment plants in the region that put water back into the, to the river system at seven different places, okay? You, in theory, that makes for a whole host of different separation scenarios. You can put a wall at different places that will impede invasive species movement. It would also impede freight movement. And in theory, the water to the east would run to the lake and the water to the west would continue to run to the Mississippi. And so some of the wastewater treatment plants would be putting water in the river that ran to the lake and some would be continuing to put it in the, in the river to the west of the barrier to continue navigation levels there so that you could continue to move freight through. We don't want to dewater the canal. We want to keep water levels sufficient for, for navigation. This is not going to be simple, right? Um, so. Uh, how hard is it to take nitrates and phosphates out of the water? I saw this living machine wastewater treatment thing up in uh, upper Wisconsin at the conserve yeah. school. It's, a, it's an issue of scale, right? Uh, the Stickney wastewater treatment plant treats on an average day 750 million gallons of water. On a rainy day, that can go up to 1.2 on a sort of slightly rainy day. The capacity is like 1.7. Um, and on really, really, really rainy days, it overwhelms the capacity and we have to release raw sewage into Lake Michigan until the TARP deep tunnel project comes, comes fully online. Um, I, I, I am not a wastewater engineer. I don't know the steps required to do it. The easiest thing to do is not to put them in there in the first place. Uh, and so that's being a mindful consumer of your household cleaning products uh, as well as the fertilizers and stuff you're using on your, your lawn and your garden and whatever. Uh, being mindful about not throwing pharmaceuticals down the toilet pharmaceuticals don't get taken out in the wastewater treatment process. So the, the, yeah, uh, it takes a lot to take them out. It takes a lot less, but in a decentralized way to keep them from going in. Re read the labels when you, when you buy stuff and encourage other people to do the same thing, so. As we replace sewer pipes, what materials are we using? My second question is, what countries, I'm thinking of China, are, uh, when they're, uh, there's, they're building new cities, uh, Dubai, what are they doing with their water systems that's very progressive because they're starting from the ground up? Um, different places do different things. Some places are building separated systems, which costs more in the short term, but long term you don't get as many of these combined sewer issues. What, I mean, one of the major differences between the way thing, we do things in the U.S. and the way we do things in the rest of the world or other parts of the world in most other parts of the world, there's a concept called integrated water resources management, right? Basically, it's that one set of decision makers is concerned with water supply, stormwater, and wastewater management, right? And you look at the entire water system and try to manage the human interaction with it. Here in Chicago, just as an example, the water, the drinking water, comes from Chicago Department of Water Management, so that's a city function and the pipes that bring it to you are also city. The pipes, the sewer pipes that take it away are still city. Then the sewer pipes dump into the wastewater treatment process, which is MWRD, right? So you already have multiple agencies here concerned with different aspects of the system, okay? Um, they have different goals, they have different requirements, and they think differently. We do not, as a rule, have integrated water resource management here in, here in the United States. Uh, and that in itself is a problem. So most other places in the world do. Many other places, I should say. Um, the current pipes that we're putting in, uh, I don't know what material they are. They're not trees. Um, they're typically not brick. 
Uh, in some places, they're PVC. In some places, they're some sort of metal alloy. Yeah, they're not trees. And then in places like Dubai, I mean, they show Las Vegas up here. Las Vegas is ridiculous in concept, right? That we have this huge, booming metropolis in a place with no water, right? If you go to a hotel in Las Vegas, the water that comes out of your sink, you flush down your toilet the day before, and it was in the sink the day before, and the toilet the day before, and the sink the day before that, right? Those hotels and many of the homes, many of the businesses are required to have internal water recycling systems, okay? Um, just like now, you can't grow lawn, you have to use native planting, whatever. So Las Vegas, while a ridiculous place, is actually one of the better models for conservation and efficiency programs. The problem is it's a ridiculous place to begin with, so you can only be that so conscientious. Uh, yeah. Sir, you mentioned uh, the empty lots in Chicago. Uh, I've heard the mayor of Detroit wants to turn half of Detroit into an urban farm. Mm -hmm. uh, what percentage uh, of Chicago is urban lots? Do we have, what is this, what do you, what do you think of the percentage of? of I mean, I city? can make up a number and hope that you don't fact check it. Um, yeah, I don't, well, how I, can I, yeah. 12%, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I mean, the majority of Chicago, the majority of Cook County is hard surface, is, is pavement, okay? Either roads, alleyways, roofs, or driveways, okay? The, the majority, all right? In certain, in, certainly in downtown Chicago, it's close to 100%. As you get further away, it diminishes, but overall, it's, it's more than 50% of the region is paved over, okay? Um, vacant lots in the city, certainly on the north side, you have fewer because the population is just denser. Uh, on the south side, you have many, many more. So in certain pockets, it could be 30 to 40 percent. In other places, it's going to be closer to none. But I don't know. Nothing there. There's like two houses. I mean, it's this, this huge area. Go, go take a look sometime. You can drive like 100 miles an hour down these streets because there's nothing that don't do that. There, you could though, right? That is an area that could be used for something and currently isn't. And there are pockets like that throughout the city. But I don't have a percentage for you. Sorry. We have time for one more question. All right. Are you going to ask me how long it takes me to shower as a comparison <laughs> for yourself? No. <laughs> we have simil guess, similar follicle issues here. Yes. So. It doesn't take me a long time to wash my hair. No. Um, I guess one question I want to ask, the, the business of the open lots yeah. and using water conservation, what, how do you get around the issues of mosquitoes? That's a good issue. Um, I mean, the mosquitoes are a problem when you have s standing water, right. right? Standing water in heat, right? So you, you'd have to figure out a way to prevent the water from standing for a long time, okay? Um, I don't know. Uh, make sure that you solvable? have- It's Solvable? It's solvable, sure, okay. sure. I mean, we don't have malaria in Jackson Park, right? right? I hope I go through there all the time. Um, so there are, you know, there are ways to have, make sure that there are natural predators, spiders, and things like that in there, and make sure that the water is not sitting in one place for long periods of time. Sure. Okay. Yeah. For trolls to live. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I no no no, that's great. Yeah, there are ways there are ways to solve it with and with things that already live here as opposed to bringing in some crazy, you know, viper or whatever from somewhere in South America that will then take over the city, right? There there are natural solutions here in the here in the region to do it. So, 